Howdy there once again, YouTube. My name is Ben Ferriolo, and I am dedicated to the responsible and accurate seismic monitoring of volcanic and tectonic hazard areas. First off, if you have not already, please bookmark my website. A link is provided under my email address in the description box below, and it contains a great deal of information, including how to understand the many types of plots and charts people use, how to find, access, and analyze seismic data, and it also contains hundreds upon hundreds of seismic plots and images regarding a great many seismic events and swarms on many different pages. Trust me, you'd be surprised as to what you find. So, we're here at the Upper Geyser Basin at Old Faithful. Okay, so I just want to take a look at the most recent earthquakes, just real quick. In the past 24 hours, as of 10.39 a.m., March 11, 2019, there have been 249 reported earthquake events in the past, again, past 24 hours for the whole world for all magnitudes. Of course, that number is most likely much higher since the small earthquakes, oh, look, and one just got added. Since the small earthquakes, you know, around Italy, you know, near Mount Etna, the smaller events there uh, usually are not reported by USGS. Same like within Greece. I think uh, for the areas that USGS does not monitor greatly, but is monitored by other seismic agencies, I believe USGS for like, you know, Italy, Greece, Russia, areas like that, I believe that they only report earthquakes magnitude 3.5 and above, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. So let's click the largest magnitude first. It was a 5.9 near the Rake Jeans Ridge. I do not know how to say that. I'm probably saying it wrong. Rick Jeans. Rick Jeans. <laughs> I'm really bad at pronouncing new words. Uh, 5.9, 10.0 kilometers in depth. Don't know if the depth is right. 5.8 in Papua New Guinea again. 5.5 near that same ridge up near Iceland. They've been having a big increase in seismicity there. Some in Japan, Alaska. Oh, look at this. Tanaga Volcano in Alaska. The Aleutian Islands of Alaska between Russia and Alaska. Uh, there was a 5.2 at 47.8 kilometers in depth. And notice how uh, there are no earthquakes being reported for Yellowstone, even though some did occur today. And then we had a 3.2 in Trinidad, Colorado, but I believe that is part of the aftershocks from those sequences of earthquakes that occurred near Mount Lindsay. If you don't know about that, then just go into my videos on my YouTube channel and look back to where I talked about Mount Lindsay in Colorado. And then we also had off here a 2.3 in Virginia, which is a strange location for an earthquake. So this magnitude 2.3 in Virginia at 1.2 kilometers in depth. About 14 people reported feeling it. Now let's see what part of Virginia it occurred. It looks like right on the border of... Let's zoom out. Let's zoom out. What is that, North Carolina? I think that's North Carolina, right? Yes, it is. Okay. So just on the border between Virginia and North Carolina near Bristol and Kingsport. Here we are in the seismic program swarm with data retrieved from station LRVA in the ET network short period vertical and 00 location code. Let's turn persistent rescale off and set overlap to 95 on the spectrogram. Do not need a frequency filter right yet. So the earthquake occurred around 227, right? That's this one right here. This was apparently the 2.3 at, oh, how did it occur? 2.3 at 1.2 kilometers in depth, very shallow. Very small as well, and did not show up that strong on this station, actually, which was reportedly the closest seismic station to this event. Let's check out the dominant frequencies, shall we? Dominant lower frequencies. Now, this could be part of the microseism lower frequency band, but I do believe the frequencies do start around, I'm going to say, maybe 0.5 hertz, which is very low for any seismic event to start that is not related to microseisms. Then it dips down. We see another jump at about 2.2 hertz, dips down again. Then we see the largest, the most powerful frequency was between 3.07 and 4 hertz. Here's the spectrogram plot of the magnitude 2.3. You can tell it is very, very tiny, very weak, very, very weak. Remember, spectrogram plots and other plots on here as well. You can zoom in and zoom out as much as you want. And again, there it is, magnitude 2.3 in Virginia, with some strange little bit lower frequencies than what I would expect in the surface waves. So, so I want to move on to Yellowstone real quick. You know I don't like to use this, this thing on .org a lot. However, I do use it for quick overview. For example, it's a lot easier to just go on here and look at all the stations and say, oh, where, where are there earthquakes? Oh, there's earthquakes at Yellowstone Lake, or 
This one clicks down a borehole 944. Okay, let's download the data. It is much easier to do that than download the data from all the stations and then look at all the data to see if there's any earthquakes. It's much easier to just look at it for a quick overview. But usually what I do is I see, oh, look, earthquakes at Yellowstone Lake, download the data, let's see what it looks like, you know, which we'll do in just a second. We'll take a look. We're going to talk about Steamboat Geyser in just a second. It did erupt again just a little bit ago. Now let's go to borehole 208. It is showing some earthquakes, most likely in a rapid fire fashion, and then some microquakes afterwards, which I will show. Then borehole 944 is showing some separate earthquakes separated from this swarm, I believe, these two right here, which also show up quite well on Seismic Station YEE, so it's possible. It did occur near that strange earthquake epicenter not too long ago, which was about east, northeast of Yellowstone Lake, kind of in this area right here. So why don't we go download the data from borehole 208 and check it out. Here we are back at the seismic program swarm with the data stream for borehole 208 in the PB network, short period vertical, no location code, turn persist to rescale off and set 95 as the overlap for the spectrogram. Do not need a frequency filter right now. Notice little teeny tiny 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 events, a 60 amplitude count, 50 amplitude count, very tiny um, hours before this swarm even occurred. We see a teleseism up here because there have been some, uh, the ring of fire really has been heating up lately, guys, with multiple fives, a uh, few sixes actually as well. Then we had another earthquake right here, which I thought was quite intriguing. Seems to be more upwards energy. Remember, this is a short period vertical station. Any vertical station with a vertical component, that means that up will be motion going towards the surface. Down will be down. That is why sometimes with the P wave arrival, according to Iris, according to Iris, because I'm still learning this stuff, guys. I still got a lot to learn. And there are still many things that I do not understand about this. And there's still many events that I have a hard time deciphering. But apparently a downwards dipping P wave shows that the station detected dilation when looking at a vertical station. And also when the P wave goes upwards, it's showing compression, I guess. That's what Iris told me. And that does kind of make sense. Don't know what this event is right here. Very, very strange. So let's zoom down and let's look at the swarm, shall we? So we had a few little tiny poppings throughout the day. Little teeny, 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 tiny guys. Then we had a very strange earthquake at 932 UTC, which I thought was very strange because it looks like a very deep event or kind of looks like a regional earthquake too, doesn't it? It does kind of. Only going to 400 amplitude count, so it's not major. Dominant high range frequencies, this looks like a local earthquake. This does look like this occurred somewhere near Yellowstone Lake. Probably farther away. This is probably one of the earthquakes that occurred east, northeast of Yellowstone Lake, which is one of the earthquakes that showed up on YEE, which this one right here as well, which looks very similar to the previous earthquake. This one did occur farther east, I believe. Showed up on many surrounding stations, much deeper earthquake. Do not know why they have not reported this yet. I am unsure. It's Monday. It's Monday and they are not on break. So I am unsure why they have not reported any of these earthquakes as of yet. Very strange. Let's go to the spectrogram, shall we? Dominant lower frequencies on this event right here. Check this out. Very strange. Very strange event. So let's go forward. Boom! We see a rapid fire swarm at Yellowstone. Look at that. Rapid fire swarm. It was not major. Very teeny tiny events. Look, and then the rapid fire swarm comes back just barely with a few aftershocks. But the main sequence is right here. Notice how first it builds. Notice how the beginning of the swarm builds with the, these higher frequencies. Notice there are stronger higher frequencies as the swarm was building than lower frequencies. And then we see pretty much normal rapid fire earthquakes that are seen around West Thumb Yellowstone Lake. I was expecting the next one, which was this one, to be much more major. About a week ago or so, I said that another rapid fire swarm could be approaching. I was kind of right. I thought it was going to be much more major than this because we have not seen a major rapid fire swarm since, I believe, July 5th. July 5th, 2018 was, I believe, the last time we saw the most major rapid fire swarm but then again there are some very interesting seismic plots and images on my website if you go to my website link in the description box below uh, go to the seismic events drop down menu and click the west thumb rapid fire or rapid energetic swarms or whatever it says for west thumb but look it looks like it just slowly builds and magnitudes are not that great the tallest amplitude of this entire swarm 
is about 4,000 amplitude count at the max, which is very small. And then they, but then again, they still are not reporting these slightly larger earthquakes, which one occurred before and one occurred after, looking almost exactly the same. A few more microquakes later on. Teleseism there. That's pretty much it for Bohor 208. 208, excuse me. Now let's move on to YNM. And here we are at Seismic Station YNM, which is at the Norris Museum. Notice there's a slight, tiny, bold line right there, right? Hey, I thought that was a steamboat eruption. It was. Steamboat erupted today, guys. Notice how you can barely see it. So keep this in mind. You can barely see it. We'll check it out in the Seismic Program Swarm in just a second. But I thought that this is much, much weaker. Much weaker than what we usually see. Well, let's go to YNR. Notice this bold line here. I do not know if it coincides perfectly. We will have to analyze it in the program swarm. But it is possible the steamboat eruption, although being much weaker than all of the other eruptions, still showed on YNR. If so, this, is, this will be the second time that it showed on YNR while being weaker and weaker. That, to me, in my opinion, that's not possible. But it is happening, so we will check it out in the Seismic Program Swarm in just a second. What I wanted to do to confirm this eruption, along with the Seismic Trace and the Spectrogram and Spectroplots, I wanted to go over here. So we are at the Tantalus Creek Station at Norris, which can detect these steamboat eruptions from the water discharge. Notice the last high, perfect, right angle spike. Notice these are what steamboat eruptions look like. Precipitation spikes never look like this. Precipitation spikes look like this, look like this. They can sometimes have these little tick marks too at the top, but these are real actual steamboat eruptions because they start almost immediately, just like a hydrothermal eruption. So this is the last one, right? It does not look very tall. This is from March 5th, March 4th through the 5th, which is when we saw the last steamboat eruption. Here's today's steamboat eruption, wow. So the seismic trace is smaller. The amplitudes are smaller, which means the strength of the vibrations is not as strong. But more water was produced during this eruption than last eruption, even though possibly this eruption was stronger than this one. How is that possible? And both these eruptions are starting to show on Seismic Station YNR. Is something changing with Steamboat Geyser? Maybe, because it seems like things are starting to shift for the infamous geyser, which currently right now is the largest active geyser in the entire world. And you can also see these spikes here, gauge height feet. Again, it's looking like this steamboat eruption put out much more water than the previous one. So steamboat's definitely not dying yet, guys. He's holding on for dear life. But things are changing. Things are definitely changing for Steamboat Geyser. So why don't we pull up Seismic Station YNM and YNR in the Seismic Program Swarm. Okay, guys, so check this out. This is the ninth Steamboat Eruption of 2019, which would be the 41st Steamboat Eruption since it reactivated in early 2018. Notice you can see a tiny burst, tiny increase in energy on the spectrogram right here. And we do have the previous burst in energy for the Steamboat Eruption right here as well. Because how Steamboat has been acting lately is it sees a small burst in energy, dies down for about a minute or two, and then the main eruption kicks in. All right, so let's look at this. Amplitude counts only, barely going beyond the background microseisms. The background microseisms usually stay around 1,800 amplitude count or so, fluctuating up or down. This went up to about 2,700, barely even reaching 3,000. So this was definitely officially the smallest steamboat eruption ever recorded by seismic station YNM. But hold on a second. Hold on a second. Check this out. So on the spectrogram, remember this pattern, a small tiny burst far before 8. Probably that's like 754 or 756 or something like that. Actually, that's, that is 754. Never mind. And the, then about a minute or, wow, about six minutes goes by. And then the main eruption kicks in, primarily around 809. So look what I have on Seismic Station YNR, which is farther to the southeast, which usually should not show these steamboat eruptions because they're too weak. They, even if they're putting out more water and they're carrying less surface vibration, this still should not show on Seismic Station YNR unless it's reaching like 15,000 amplitude count or so. You know what I mean? It still shouldn't. But look, around 754, just like we saw on the 8th eruption of 2019, this ninth eruption of 2019, the first burst started 
right here. Notice at the same exact time that it shows on Seismic Station Y and M. Now let's go forward. Okay, and then a few minutes goes by, right? Uh, about six minutes or so, and then it starts right here. Notice the, look at that. The frequencies increase right there. Okay, I'm going to add a filter. I'm going to add a filter just real quick to YNR so we can get rid of these background microCSMs and look at just the steamboat eruption itself. So I'm going to do a 18 hertz high pass filter. That's very high, very high high pass filter. But we're going to do that to get rid of those background microCSMs. Double it. Make it extra strength. Okay, there you go. Now you can see the eruption, huh? Perfect. That drew out the eruption perfectly. Remember, it started, the first burst started around 754, which is right here. And look at that. Around 812, the increase begins. Around 812, the increase, yeah, it matches up perfectly, guys, on the spectrogram and on the seismogram plots for both seismic station Y and M and seismic station Y and R. But I find it strange that the frequencies are much higher. Notice the frequency range on this spectrogram goes up to 50 hertz. Notice frequency hertz is a frequency label on the left. So the frequencies are much higher being recorded on station Y and R than they are in Y and M because the frequencies, again, spectrogram range up to 50 hertz. Notice that. Again, it's only remaining. It's not really going past 23 hertz, but the frequencies up here are going all the way up to, what, 46 hertz. So why is that? Why is that? I do not know, actually. But Station Y N R and Station Y N M both detected this eruption for sure. Now, this eruption, again, was the smallest eruption ever recorded by Seismic Station Y N M. But the stream gauge shows that this eruption did put out more water than the last one. The eighth eruption of 2019, which is the one right before this, put out less water, but was stronger than this one. How is that possible? How is I thought the surface vibrations were being caused by the water ejecting from the geyser, right? Well, I may have been wrong. I think I may have been wrong. They are still surface vibrations because the steamboat eruptions start right when the trace starts. So we know that they're likely surface vibrations. But how are they traveling to YNR? And how are they not directly correlated to the amount of water being ejected? Isn't that strange? I found that very strange that more water was ejected during this eruption, but this eruption was weaker. Very interesting. What do you guys think? Just let me know what you think. So I'm going to go back just real quick to here. Press right now just to see if there's any activity since I started recording. Not really remember. There's a tiny rapid fire swarm near West, um, actually, never mind, excuse me, near Yellowstone Lake. Then we had a few other smaller earthquakes throughout the area that look actually pretty deep. I'm going to say maybe around 10, 11 kilometers in depth, maybe down to 9. Uh, but that's pretty much it. Steamboat Geyser did erupt today. I have not updated the plots to this eruption on my website yet, but I will in just a bit. And yep, that's it right now. Let's look at the latest earthquakes real quick. Seems to have calmed down in the past hour, but earthquakes are still popping off. Yesterday, the Ring of Fire was pretty active, guys. It was pretty active. Earthquakes popping up all over the place. So, and this one occurred near 5.0, near the Western Indian Antarctic Ridge. So, I will be back soon. God bless. And it looks like another earthquake was just reported for Utah. Yeah, they've been having an increase in seismicity as of late. And also, oh my goodness, I just came here and it looks, wow, very active. Look at that. We got one going off there and Old Faithful seems to be about to erupt as well. Pretty active today. Very interesting. Actually, perfect timing. Looks like Steamboat, uh, Steamboat, excuse me, <laughs> Old Faithful is erupting right now. Aha, uh -huh, it is. People got their cameras out. There's a lot of people there right now. Let's see how big the eruption gets. Come on, buddy. Get higher, get higher, you got it. Woohoo! I love those old faithful eruptions, guys. But personally, can can you guys email me? Everybody who hears this, can you email me? Just send me a quick email saying yes, I want it, or something like that. Ask send me because I'm trying to write a petition trying to get USGS to add a webcam for Steamboat Geyser, a live streaming webcam, not a static cam but a webcam for Steamboat Geyser in the Norris Geyser Basin.
because it has become almost just as popular as Old Faithful, so they really should put a webcam there before they put it anywhere else. And notice whenever the steam comes out and the water comes out from Old Faithful, it melts all of the snow immediately. And that's erupting back there as well. And also, do not forget about the new warning that USGS has for California. The potential for damaging earthquakes, landslides, floods, tsunamis, and wildfires is widely recognized in California. Guys, do not live in California. Get out now. Seriously, not just because of this eruption, just because it's a bad state to live in. I swear, I'm sorry. It, but it's because people have made it bad. Not only does it have natural disasters like some other states, you know, there are many states that even have tornadoes, you know. Then people aren't leaving that. that cut that. And people aren't leaving their homes there. But in California, people are leaving because people are destroying it with their policies. And I'm sorry. I, I, I always made a promise that I would try my best not to talk about politics on here. But so, I'll move on. So it says uh, about as frequently, uh, what does it say? Okay, the same cannot be said for volcanic hazards, despite the fact that eruptions occur in the state about as frequently as the largest earthquakes on the San Andreas Fault in San Francisco. At least 10 volcanic eruptions have taken place in California in the past 1,000 years. Most recent is the Lassen Peak eruption of 1914 to 1917. Uh-oh, that's 102 years ago. And future volcanic eruptions are inevitable. Based on the record of volcanism over the past few millennia, the likelihood of another eruption occurring in California in the next 30 years is 16%. You ask any volcanologist, that's a pretty high percentage for the next 30 years for California. So just putting that warning out there that the next disaster to strike California may not be a wildfire or an earthquake. It might be a volcanic eruption because there's a lot of volcanoes down there, guys, and I think one of them could be popping soon. You never know, but 16% in the next 30 years, that's pretty high. So keep your head up. Monitor these areas very closely with accuracy and responsibility, and you guys are good. Remember, the truth is always considered hate or fear to those who hate or fear the truth. That is for sure. God bless, guys.